coming up next on Legislative Week in Review. And the home of the brave. Opening ceremonies of the 2020 legislative session features a historic moment for the House. Madam Speaker, offer my congratulations. The governor's state of the state address and the Republican response. Black men and Asian men are uh, misidentified through facial recognition a hundred times more than white men. Facial recognition technology gets looked at by the Senate. I believe a person of color that's an immigrant, that this would impact, uh, like someone had just said, this impacts Asians specifically. I feel like I am at the table, literally. While over in the House, comprehensive sex education for K through 12 receives a crowded public hearing. And they deserve to have um, the information that's accurate, the toolkit to be able to make informed decisions to become healthy young adults. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Week in Review, covering the 2020 legislative session. This episode covers the opening week of session, including a historic moment in the House as a new speaker takes the gavel for the first time in 20 years, the governor's state of the state speech, and hearings on data privacy. And the home of the brave. On January 13th, Opening ceremonies in the Washington State House confirmed the first new speaker in 20 years, as Representative Lori Jenkins was handed the gavel. With her election as House Speaker, Jenkins represents many firsts for the state of Washington. I, Lori Jenkins. I, Lori Jenkins. Do hereby affirm. Do hereby affirm. That I will uphold the Constitution. That I will uphold the Constitution. And laws of the United States of America. And laws of the United States of America. The Constitution and Laws. The Constitution and Laws. Of the State of Washington. Of the State of Washington. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of Speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives. Of Speaker of the Washington State House of Representatives. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations, Lori. Thank you. <laughs> Before she could begin her speech, Representative John Lovick reminded the audience that they were witnessing a historic moment for the state. I want to take a moment to recognize that we are all witnessing history today. Another barrier falls as the first woman in Washington state will stand on this spot and hold this gavel as Speaker of the House. Madam Speaker, offer my congratulations. Jenkins laid out her agenda for the entire 98 representative body, which focused on health care, living expenses, and the struggles of homelessness. Those who can't access health care due to cost or geography, those who are grappling with opioid addiction or another substance use disorder, those who are falling behind in an economy that's not working for everyone. There are emergencies all across the state and one in every community I visited this year was housing and homelessness. I heard about it from the good member from the 39th in Salton and, good, and the good member from the 3rd in Spokane. And I, the good member from the 19th actually drove me through a homeless encampment in Aberdeen. I heard it from many, many others of you too. We have to focus our time in this 60-day session working to ensure greater stability for families and communities by getting people inside, out of the cold, with a roof over their heads, and somewhere to build a life. Jenkins also focused on the rising expense of child care. Another issue that touches all of us is the lack of affordable child care. This hurts families and businesses. Last year, the Association of Washington Business reported nearly 50% of Washington's parents found it difficult to find affordable childcare. That no, not only hurts families, but it's costing our businesses over $2 billion a year. You know, over the holidays, my wife and I had a couple, um, two couples over who had one-year-old kids and we had them over for breakfast, and it was really troubling to hear them talk about how difficult it was to find childcare and how expensive it was. Linda, 
Yasmin. We're going to do things to help you, to help Shoshana, to help Rumi, and your families this year. Jenkins laid out the transportation battle budget ahead with Initiative 976 public vote passage and the potential implementation if the Supreme Court upholds the measure. What's important, though, is that we keep moving forward. And that's not always easy. This session, we're going to be grappling with the effects of Initiative 976 on, trans on our transportation system. I am not going to sugarcoat it. The impacts of this initiative are devastating to transportation in our state, particularly for seniors, people with disabilities, and people with low incomes, many of whom they rely on our buses, our ferries, our trains, and other forms of public transportation. We will fight to protect the most vulnerable in our communities. I am really grateful to my seatmate, the good member from the 27th, who's working with the good member from the second, Representative Barkas, to do this. We'll work with our colleagues across the rotunda and the governor to keep Washington moving. It's gonna be hard, but we will do this hard work together. House Republican leader J.T. Wilcox, with 40 representatives in his caucus, then provided his response to the entire House floor. He challenged the 56 Democratic member majority to be active listeners to the Republican minority. This is a place where you talk about conflict. And at its best, it's a place where you help resolve conflict. And Madam Speaker, uh, one of the things that I really appreciate that you recently said is you talk about how your job is to listen. And Madam Speaker, we're the minority. That means that we don't get to win a lot of things. Uh, our number one job is to speak and debate. And we can help you do your job and you can help us do our job when you and all of your colleagues are the best possible listeners. Wilcox also spoke on the issue of housing, which he said became divisive during the 2019 legislative session. Let's, let's try to de-escalate the ideology. Uh, I, I thought that we had some tragedy last year when we did housing. You know, there was a report that came out recently that said there was 255, there was a shortage of 255,000 housing units. Uh, over the last 15 years. The private sector used to produce housing in abundant quantities. I know my parents uh, built the house that I live in uh, for almost nothing by, uh, in today's terms. And to reproduce that now uh, is out of reach for many people. So let's, let's not just try to provide public housing. Let's try to fix the regulatory and the tax and the cost system so that the private sector can do their part. Wilcox then challenged his fellow lawmakers to end title-only bills, which are bills written on short notice with little information and a lack of public hearings. By really trying hard to make sure that we're not surprising people, that the groups and the public that are affected by any bill really gets a chance to evaluate those things, come down here, do their citizens' duty, uh, lobby themselves, and help us make the very best possible decisions. And a public hearing on House Bill 2325. The House Appropriations Committee held an afternoon hearing on the Governor Inslee's proposed operating budget with Office of Financial Management Director David Schumacher stating that the state's robust economy has been driving state coffers. Um, it seems like it's been a while since we had um, as, as few financial difficulties as we, we do right now. We've, we had a, a year where the caseloads went up over the interim, but revenues went up roughly by similar amounts, so we are in a roughly similar place that we were when we all left town last year. And it seems to me that that's, uh, that's not been the case in, in recent years. A large percentage of the entire state budget is earmarked towards funding public schools. 64% of the growth has been in public schools. So we, we're now up to a little over half of the budget is K-12, but as we've decided about how to spend the increase 
in the budget over the last the last several biennia, we have spent almost 64 percent of that on public schools. Now that, as we've worked our way through McCleary, that should not come as a surprise, but this shows kind of graphically what the budget decisions that have been made by the last few legislatures um, to set the groundwork for this, this supplemental. Schumacher then laid out Governor Inslee's homeless strategy, which proposed taking $319 million out of the state's rainy day fund by eliminating half of the homeless population by 2022. What the legislature and the governor have not often done is try to ad address the sheltering problem directly. That's often been more of a, of a city issue. What the, what the governor has decided is that, you know, the cities are doing their best, but it's obvious when we look outside that the core problems aren't solving the problem fast enough to bail out the cities and the problem that they have. I think the things that we are doing in the base budget are effective. I, I've seen some newspaper articles that suggest that maybe we're turning the corner. I don't want to get out ahead of that. I think we probably have a ways to go. But it seems like a lot of that is, is doing a lot of good. That said, I mean, you can just drive down the freeway or look under a bridge and you see that there too many Washington residents don't have a real place to be. And what we have done in this budget is proposed $319 million to come out of the budget stabilization account to try to specifically address sheltering. So that's enhancing current shelters, that's building new shelters, partnering with cities, um, making a, a lot of improvements, the goal of which is to reduce unsheltered Washingtonians by 50% within within two years. Call to order the capital budget meeting for January 14th. We get started with the House Capital Budget Committee, which held a work session and public hearing to discuss the supplemental budget on January 14th. Committee Chair, Democrat Representative Steve Thuringer, reminded the entire committee that it was not the time to ask for more money for constituent projects. That's really the takeaway message for folks. To, that uh, shows the, <laughs> the lack of funds here in the supplemental, very much a very true supplemental process where we might move dollars around within existing allocations to meet demand, but there is very little uh, new money. So just take note as you're talking to your constituents who I know have many desires with uh, for capital dollars but the this is the supplemental is not the time to to fund those projects so and thank you for senior me. analyst for the governor's she office of financial management Jen Masterson presented the funds available to spend on the governor's proposed plan to increase the capacity for shelters and new programming aimed at eliminating half of the homeless population by 2022. The governor proposes a $30 million grant program for the construction of new enhanced shelters <coughs> and the enhancement of basic drop-in shelters through facility improvements such as laundries, bathrooms, and storage spaces. Experience has shown that shelters providing day access, secure storage, and hygiene facilities tend to have higher utilization. And when those sites are linked with other service programs, which the governor has proposed in the operating budget, we see better results. We estimate this $30 million will enhance 117 shelters, expand 39 shelters, and construct six new shelters for a total of 1,300 new shelter beds and enhancements for 3,500 existing beds. Uh, as Director Schumacher presented to the House Appropriations Committee yesterday, this funding is out of the Housing Trust account following a transfer from the Budget Stabilization account. Masterson then focused on a $15 million ask by Governor Inslee for state institution improvements. This is what the OFM Capital team calls the broccoli of the budget. Um, by that, I mean projects like leaking pipes at Monroe Correctional Complex, which are causing water infiltration into the walls. Um, or projects like the main dock at McNeil Island, which is cracked and damaged beyond repair. Although these projects are not very glamorous, they keep state institutions running safely. The governor's office of financial management then asked for an investment in K through 12 public schools. Based off of a school seismic safety assessment, 
authorized by the legislature in 2019. The governor proposes a new grant program to local school districts for seismic retrofit and safety related improvements to schools. Funding is also provided for state grants to local school districts to conduct rapid visual screening assessments of schools. These assessments identify inventory and score buildings according to their risk of collapse from a major earthquake and will help identify and prioritize future seismic projects. Would the House and Senate and all of our guests please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Governor Jay Inslee. On January 14th, Governor Jay Inslee provided his State of the State speech to the House and Senate, laying out his 2020 legislative agenda with lawmaking vision towards the next decade in Washington State. One of our deepest Washington values is summoning the courage to explore and embrace big ideas, ideas that actually change our lives. And the people who power our state's successes have shared a common element, a stalwart and unbending commitment to be better, to get the job done, and never resign to those timid souls who think that the status quo is good enough. Our embrace of new ideas speaks to who we are as a people. And as we start a new decade, we can reflect on how we've reached that. We are willing to imagine where we could go if we accepted challenges that at first felt impossible. We can do this because we recognize we belong to one community. We forge profound forces for good when we unite, not divide, around our best ideas. Inslee focused on the inclusive issue of homelessness, which he said didn't discriminate against age, ethnicity, or gender. We know that homelessness reaches all ages, all races, all backgrounds. And we know there is no one cause. This doesn't impact just people experiencing mental health challenges or chemical dependency problems. Thousands of people uh, know that Washington is the best place to live and work in the country. So they've come here. That's a good thing. And while we're pleased with our economic growth, we also have people who have faced economic problems that put affording a place of their own out of reach, in part because we have not built enough housing for the people who are coming to this state. It's not just people living in tents or under freeways, in wet cardboard boxes. We have families living in cars, veterans who need help staying in their apartment, single parents facing financial struggles, high school students sleeping on other people's couches when they can find one. And too many people are one financial crisis away from being homeless. Each year, we know in the past decade, we've done more to address homelessness and housing affordability. We've doubled our state's investment in homelessness response since the recession. And I want to thank you for your leadership in that regard. We've combated several causes of homelessness like opioid addiction and mental illnesses. We've laid a strong foundation. But I've seen this growing crisis firsthand. I've seen it all over the state. I've seen how it affects Centralia, Bellingham, Spokane, Tacoma, and Bremerton. I believe we have an obligation to help solve this problem. Our compassion will not allow us to look the other way. Inslee talked about the need for clean fuel standard legislation in Washington State in 2020. We know this. Washington State is not a state of climate denial. It is a state of climate science acceptance. And for those who say... those who say that we should not take action, I say that climate inaction is just as deadly as climate denial. This is the year for climate action. It's time to pass a Washington law for Washington jobs, for Washington drivers, and Washington children 
and let's bring this success home this year. Inslee concluded his speech with a message of unity to the House and Senate lawmakers. The, the good news is we can do these things. We can because we are the state that embraces the biggest ideas and tries the newest things. Our ambitions can sound daunting, but we know the path to get there. Look what we've done in the state of Washington. We have made something that is indisputable. We have made something that is inspiring. We have created a spark that ignites our innovation, our collaboration, our communities, our partnerships, and the big ideas that we fit into this state. We experience the best of Washington when we come together. We've just heard the governor's view of how things are in our state. Senator John Braun provided the Republican response to Governor Inslee's State of the State speech. Braun advocated to protect the Rainy Day Fund from Governor Inslee's homelessness plan. This time, he wants to pull more than $300 million out of the state's Rainy Day Fund. As the Republican leader on Ways and Means Committee, I can tell you we need that money in the Rainy Day Fund for when the state economy slows. That's what the voters intended. If the governor believes more tax dollars are the best response to the homeless situation, he needs to look somewhere besides the state savings account. Braun also highlighted Initiative 976 Public Vote Passage, which limited car tabs to $30, and if enacted, will also have a major impact on the transportation budget. Braun said that Republicans had a solution to respect the voice of the voters while avoiding massive cuts to schools. But when those in control ignored the very people who were hurting, the result was Initiative 976. Republicans have legislation to keep the $30 license tabs as the voters directed. And it would not take money away from schools in spite of what the governor claims. The Environment, Energy and Technology Committee of your Washington State Senate will come to order. Consumer data privacy and facial recognition were discussed at the Senate Environment, Energy and Technology Public Hearing on Wednesday, January 15th. SB 6281 restricts private consumer data usage, creates business thresholds, and authorizes enforcement by the state's attorney general. It also provides regulatory framework on commercial facial recognition usage. Washington Retail Association's Mark Johnson had concerns about the bill's impact on consumer experiential marketing. Loyalty programs, we are committed to ensuring that consumers have choices, are in control of their interactions with retailers. One key option that many consumers choose is to participate in retail loyalty programs. These programs must offer discounts and other benefits for consumers who voluntarily participate. Unfortunately, as written, the new anti-discrimination language that prohibits differing prices on service levels is problematic. Thus, we urge that this new language either be removed or amended to ensure that consumer loyalty programs can continue to be offered by retailers. Washington ACLU's Neil Beaver was again Against the bill, citing that facial recognition technology has misidentified black and Asian men on a larger scale, and felt that regulation of the technology didn't go far enough to evade concerns of racial bias in its usage. Whether you call it bias or whether it's unintentional, uh, black men and Asian men are uh, mis identified through facial recognition a hundred times more than white men, and we find that troubling. And sorry, we haven't participated in the process sooner. We're starting to learn more information across the country and other countries where companies like Facebook are providing body cameras to uh, law enforcement, and that information is being used to develop a variety of different AI technologies and other facial recognition technologies used in the criminal justice system and we believe that we need far stronger parameters around the use of facial recognition in the criminal justice system and until we do we need to be opposed to this bill. Senate Bill 6280 focused specifically on facial recognition requiring state and local governments to develop accountability reports and an annual report when using the technology. The bill also establishes a facial recognition task force. 
Washington ACLU representative Jennifer Lee said that the usage of facial recognition technology was a potential threat to democracy and community activism. Because this bill seeks to regulate facial recognition without first giving the communities historically most impacted by surveillance an opportunity to say yes or no to the technology. Lee's testimony drew the ire of Senator Joe Wynn, the bill's sponsor who took exception to the ACLU's claim that he had not taken enough input from minority communities, who Lee said were the most affected by facial recognition technology deployment. I want to get more feedback on the community's input. So I've met with the ACLU probably a dozen times at this point, maybe with various folks starting since last January 17th over the summer at coffee shops in West Seattle on the phone via text message. Does that count as input from communities? And Jevin, I'm, I'm assuming you agree on some of these points, right? How many times have I talked to you personally on this issue? And is that normal for a senator to come out and talk to students like that? Like maybe it is, I don't know, right? So, and also as a, I believe a person of color that's an immigrant that this would impact, uh, like somebody had just said, this impacts Asians specifically. I feel like I am at the table, literally. So I appreciate that feedback, but help me be better at this. Welcome to the January 15th Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee. Meanwhile, the January 15th Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee received emotional testimony from workers for Senate Bill 6205, which requires protocols concerning employee discrimination and abuse at home care agencies. Melissa Watts, along with her son Max, testified on behalf of the Senate bill, which she felt was necessary in order to create a safe environment for themselves and their clients. Unfortunately, the flip side of this situation is the fact that some families and homes suffer from a degree of dysfunction that can affect the home care worker in a real and sometimes frightening way. Caregivers <laughs> have to be able to make care environments safe for themselves and the people they care for, which is what this bill can do. Max and I are asking you to support this bill because it's a necessary step to make sure that caregiving is a job and a career that people feel supported in. An example of this was testimony from Danielle Green, an in-home caregiver who highlighted abuse gone unchecked. The case manager could not do much more because while my client's mother behaved in ways that made the overall care environment dangerous, they did not appear to put her son, my client, in immediate danger. The case manager is only in charge of protecting my client, not me. Actions to keep my client safe only happened when I had to report her, my client's mom, to Child Protective Services because her behavior had escalated to a point where I felt nobody in the house more importantly, my client was not safe. 14 year veteran of caregiving, Daryl Johnson shared his story about being in an uncomfortable situation where he feared losing everything due to an elderly client's inappropriate conversations. A couple of years ago, I started working for a different agency. They assigned me to work with an elderly white female twice a week, five hours a day. Part of the care plan, my work plan, meant I was responsible for bathing her. The first two weeks of working her were okay. But one day while I was preparing breakfast, my client made a comment about how she really liked male caregivers because they could lift her out of, her, out of the shower easier. I didn't, th I didn't think much of it and went on about doing my daily business as being her caregiver. A couple of days later, my client made another comment about how she's asked her previous caregiver how about how her private area looked. And he was also a man. I again tried to shrug this off as no big deal, but it made me very uncomfortable. A couple of days later, I was in the process of bathing the client, and she came out and said, are you looking down there? And I said, what? And the client said, does my vagina look good to you? And as a black man taking care of a white older female, I was scared to death. I responded, I'm not here for that. This is making me very, very uncomfortable. The client responded, I was just testing you. I'm just playing with you. The next time, a couple of days later, 
The next time I worked with her, she made this comment. Don't worry about what I said yesterday. I won't report it. And I immediately thought, I'm going to jail. Today, we are going to do a public hearing on House Bill 2277. And over in the House, the January 15th Public Hearing for Human Services and Early Learning Committee focused on ending youth solitary confinement in juvenile detention centers with testimony on House Bill 2277. Representative Republican Tom Dent asked about the need to keep out of control youth isolated to protect themselves as well as others within the facility. If we lose solitary confinement for an individual like this, then how are we going to keep the other folks safe? I think primarily they are still very much confined, um, and they would be confined in a room with one or two staff members. And so the idea is to not put them in, a, in the hole, if you will, um, and leave them there for periods of time that become deeply damaging and uh, traumatic, uh, which also limits our ability to be effective in the other services we're trying to do the youth. Having the opportunity for a timeout, for some limited separation, for a cool down, uh, is a way to help that young person uh, both de-escalate the existing situation, but to also develop some self-regulating capacity at the same time. Representative Democrat Noel Frame said that the bill was focused on avoiding ineffective youth punishments, not effective solutions to protect everyone involved. What we are trying to achieve here is no longer using solitary confinement as a punitive measure which all the data tells us is actually an ineffective tool in the tool chest to moderate behavior of children that are having those behavioral outbursts. What we're not taking away is the ability to protect them from themselves, from other children. We've got some, looks like we've got some details to work out, but we're trying to stop using a tool that we know from all the evidence does not work in modifying behavior, not taking away tools for safety for the child, the staff, or the other children. We obviously have a very popular subject for 8 o'clock in the morning. The House Education Committee held a public hearing on January 16th on House Bill 2184, which would bring comprehensive sex education to K-12 through public schools in two years. Proponents included the Superintendent of Public Instructions, Lori Dill, who advocated for the bill, both in her role professionally and as a parent. The members of the group felt very strongly that this is an equity issue, that every single student around the state deserves exactly the same access to medically accurate, comprehensive information that protects people's health, um, especially given the rates of STDs that we're seeing increase dramatically over the last five years. And with our data summary, we did look at the last five years of data. We looked at trends and we've seen an incredibly disturbing trend with a climb in STD rates in our state. They're going to be faced with choices that we cannot deny, and they deserve to have um, the information that's accurate, the toolkit to be able to make informed decisions to become healthy young adults. We are at the cusp of a culture shift that is necessary. Uh, it's not, you can't go by the headlines and not recognize that HR um, policies across the country and corporate worlds and even here on this campus have been reevaluated because um, we have um, an, an epidemic upon us where we are responding, I think partly in this bill on a long term, to um, ensure that we have an understanding of how we are to treat one another. Critics challenge the proposed standards, especially for children in early grades K through three. A lot of people are very upset with having a standardized curriculum for K through three, uh, especially. I mean, uh, and when I looked at the curriculum, I, I'd be happy to read some of the stuff, but I will tell you that I know that the chair would gavel me because it's a completely inappropriate for me to say here. And I think that if it's inappropriate for me to say on the dais, I, I'm, I don't think that that's something that I would want to teach a kindergartner. In Battleground, we, we actually purchased the FLASH curriculum and we shared it with the community. From describing the sex act to kindergartners, having nine-year-olds playing bingo with sex words, providing absolutely no failure rates or side effects for any of the birth control methods, to reading the step-by-step -step description of an orgasm, to a co-ed classroom of 14-year-olds, and many other examples. It was clear <coughs> it was not. 
And the community said no. Why not tailor this to the, to the secondary education system? Um, I've, I've looked at the data uh, to the m representative called the air mentioned, the only plan that's been approved by OSPI that has K-2 education, those are, that's where the information's coming from. That's where those words are that we're not saying here on the dais. So why not focus on that area of you know, middle school through high school? Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chair, members of the committee, for the record. Can the Senate Committee, committee on Environment, Energy, and Technology held a January 16th public hearing on Senate Bill 5412, which establishes a clean fuels program to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. One of the things that I think is important to understand under the system is the Department of Ecology through rules and through a regulatory framework is establishing kind of the market, but by and large, this market is taking place between private entities. So they're trading credits, they're doing things internally within their business operations to achieve the reduction targets um, and to resolve that credit deficit situation under the clean fuel policy. During the bill's briefing, Senator Doug Erickson challenged staff about the cost to consumers. Under this proposal, how much of that anticipated additional cost that the consumer would be paying would go to the state of Washington in terms of additional um, fees to the, to the Treasury? So your question is, with respect to gas prices, if the prices go up, would there be fees that, w would well, any of those resources uh, come and, and to Under your state? model here in terms of an LCFS, by definition, there's going to be fees paid to go into a system that, that, that pays for something. Where, where does the money go? How much of that money would go to the state of Washington? Again, it's, it's all on a private market type system. So the answer would be none of the money generated. So let's just, for example, at a 5% um, carbon reduction and a 20 cent gas tax increase, none of that 20 cents would go to the state of Washington. That's fair. Those testifying didn't share certainty that the bill would be an effective way to reduce CO2 emissions if enacted into law. Transportation is one of the largest source of greenhouse gases in Washington State and King County. Expanded transit and clean vehicle fuel and uh, clean vehicle and fuel options are key strategies for reducing transportation-related emissions. We are working with cities to make transit easier and faster and more frequent, and to expand um, driving alternatives. This will have significant impact, but to meet our climate goals, low carbon fuels need to be more widely available for public fleets and private consumers. We need state level policy to accelerate the reduction in carbon emissions and transportation related particulates that threaten the health of our residents in King County. This is um, an extremely inefficient way to reduce CO2. Seattle City Light spends about $7 per metric ton of CO2. I spend about $10 per metric ton of CO2 at carbon projects that I invest in through the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. In in Oregon, this costs $160 per metric ton of CO2. In California, $195 per metric ton. In other words, this wastes about nine out of every $10 it spends on CO2. We can do lots of other things that reduce CO2 far more efficiently than this. This is a bill that you heard before. It actually passed the Senate and the House last year, both but in different versions. The so Senate Committee on Human Services, Reentry, and Rehab looked at the jurisdiction of youth courts on Thursday, January 16th, with Senate Bill 5640, which is a substitute of two bills which passed both chambers in 2019, but in different versions, and also failed to reach the governor's desk. Like the previous bill, this expands the current youth court statute, which is for children aged 16 through 17 years old. It expands it to include civil infractions as well as uh, traffic and transit infractions. And but also, uh, last year, your bill um, expanded it to go down to 12 years old, those 12 through 15 years old. Um, and this, this, this bill, this substitute bill, does not do that, but it instead allows the youth court to funcu function as a diversion, uh, with a refer except the referral from a diversion unit from a juvenile court, so that um, co-jurisdiction would be held by the juvenile court and the youth court under certain conditions. The substitute bill works to ensure that the offender interacts directly with peers to take responsibility, giving back to the community instead of merely paying a fine. While you have one adult court, youth court, and juvenile court, youth court, the, the combining of those two now has the protection for the juveniles that enter this kind of combined. It is rather unusual, I'll just say that very briefly, for a bill to have passed the House and passed the Senate, and then to not reach concurrence. And so there were, um, 
you know, there was an issue raised at the very end about whether or not people would have uh, the ability, juveniles would have the ability to seal their records if it goes into an adult court. And so I think we have managed, we've threaded the needle here to try to make sure that this is uh, addressing uh, diversions from juvenile court. We're very pleased on this Friday morning to uh, be here bright and early. Prescription drug prices received a public hearing on Friday, January 17th by the Senate Health and Long-Term Care Committee. Senate Bill 6087 caps the out-of-pocket expenses for a 30-day supply of insulin to $100. And we have to do something about the driving costs, the increasing costs. The state's a very large payer in this process. We have hundreds of millions of dollars out of our budget going to pay for prescription drugs for our school employees, for state employees, and um, even uh, our Apple Care enrollees. And we're not alone in this. All the other states have this problem. In fact, 60 laws were passed just last year to try and bring down costs around the state for prescription drugs. Olympia small business owner Amber Marklin shared her son's story about being diagnosed as a diabetic and advocated for the bill's passage. Life did not stop or slow down and wait for me to catch up. I was given a few vials of insulin and sent on my way. I'm in charge of keeping Levi alive with the vial of insulin every single day, three to six times per day. Our family carries the financial load of his diabetes because Levi doesn't get a choice without insulin, he dies. The bill's critics said that the cap issue would not work and instead would drive prices up. The number one goal of Washington's health care plans is to keep our members healthy and certainly access to insulin is an important part of that for uh, our members with diabetes. However, we have a competing goal of keeping the premiums as low as we possibly can for the individuals, businesses, and government entities that we serve. I think you'll, you heard in the uh, health benefit exchanges presentation earlier that people are migrating to the bronze plans for affordability issues. And so we take, we take those affordability, affordability issues very seriously. Uh, I'm gonna defer most of the rest of my time to let my colleagues speak to some of the more specific concerns around this bill. But the, the general concern is that setting a copay cap uh, won't, won't help address the underlying affordability concerns that are driven primarily by uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Caps do not address the root cause of unaffordable drugs, which is the high list price set entirely by pharmaceutical manufacturers. These caps insulate pharmaceutical manufacturers from facing public accountability for their exorbitant price increases and force health insurance carriers to absorb the higher costs. These caps also remove incentives for manufacturers to, neg to negotiate in good faith, limiting the ability of health insurance carriers to play a pivotal role in lowering the overall cost of insulin. And these in increased insulin prices must be accounted for through other means, ultimately not lowering a member's overall health care costs. Thank you for watching Legislative Week in Review. You can follow all of our stories digitally on Facebook and Twitter, as well as on TVW including the entire legislative review at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. daily, along with a weekend review on Fridays and the weekend throughout the 2020 legislative session. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.